everybody. It is morning your time. Happy Friday, otherwise. Uh, and welcome to the last day of the ALS. This is session 10B, and we're going to get started here in just a minute uh, with our first speaker. Um, just a reminder, please put any questions in the chat as they occur to you. You can flag those questions, and we'll come back at the end of each uh, talk to answer those. So I'm going to pull up the first video now. We have James Witz coming to tell us about stasis in the night. So take it away. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in, sticking around for the last day of uh, Palace. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about some uh, results from a project I've been doing as part of my postdoc at uh, the University of New Mexico, looking at evolutionary stasis in this ammonite from the Gulf and Atlantic coastal plains of the USA prior to the KPG extinction. So I probably don't need to spend too much time introducing this event. It's probably the most famous event in the geological record. Uh, the last of the big five mass extinctions 66 million years ago. And of course, for the ammonites, for the ammonoid cephalopods, this was their final extinction after nearly 300 million years as a dominant part of uh, global marine biota. Uh, and of course, there's still this big debate about the timing and nature of the KPG extinction, whether it's this single catastrophic event caused by the Chicxulub impact in the Gulf of Mexico, whether it's a more drawn out affair with some contribution from environmental change uh, driven by the emplacement of the Deccan Traps large igneous province in India. And when you look at compilations of environmental data uh, in the run up to the KPG and across the KPG boundary, such as this uh, large temperature compilation that was put together by Pincelli Hull and colleagues earlier this year in science, you do see uh, these rather prominent environmental changes uh, in the latest part of the Cretaceous, uh, highlighted here with the red circle, this prominent warming and then cooling event in the last few hundred thousand years prior to the KPG boundary and the Chicxulub impact. And this does appear to correlate with the initial emplacement of the Deccan uh, LIP. And these climate changes have been linked to both morphological and diversity changes in various taxonomic groups, which makes this an interesting time for thinking about um, biotic response to this environmental change prior to the, the impact and, and the nature and timing of the extinction. One of the best places for studying uh, the extinction in shallow marine settings is the Gulf and Atlantic coastal plains of the United States. This is a series of shallow marine sediments that outcrop all the way along this margin from sort of Texas in the southwest up to New Jersey and New York in the northeast. And over the last few years, my uh, colleague Neil Landman and our research group have been looking at these sections and constructing these new age models for the Gulf and Atlantic coastal plains in the late Cretaceous using ammonite biostratigraphy and combining that with microfossil uh, records from calcareous nanofossils and dinoflagellates and identifying these very distinctive ammonite zones. And I want to draw your attention in particular to the, the, the highest ammonite zone in North America, the Discoscophytes iris, range zone, which represents this critical time interval right before the KPG extinction and which is present all along this margin. And uh, the taxon of interest here is Discoscophytes iris. This is a scaphitid ammonite, one of the so-called heteromorph ammonites. Uh, it comes in two dimorphs, as most ammonites do, the larger macroconchs and the smaller microconchs. Uh, and these are probably sexual dimorphs uh, by comparison with modern cephalopods, so females and males. And we've assembled a data set of over 300 well-preserved specimens from eight sites in the Gulf and Atlantic coastal plains, all the way from Texas up to New Jersey, a distance of about 2,000 miles. And this provides a really nice opportunity to look at morphological variation in this single ammonite species across its entire geographic and temporal range. And obviously, uh, as well as the sort of evolutionary questions that you can use this data set to try and answer, it's also interesting to see if any morphological changes we see can be linked to any of these environmental changes prior to the KPG boundary. So just a quick look at some of the sites that we've been looking at. These are siliciclastic sections. Most of them are pretty uh, small because we're looking at a, a fairly restricted temporal window. Um, the largest is about 10 meters thick, and they represent a range of shallow marine fasces in uh, shallow water depths, probably uh, mostly less than 50 meters paleo water depth. The sites I'm going to be talking about specifically are highlighted with the red stars in the little map on the left hand side. 
And although these sections are pretty small, most of them are demonstrably complete and several of them contain these clastic event deposits at the KPG boundary, which are related directly to the chicks of the impact and have features such as impact spherules and sedimentological features, which indicate rapid deposition by processes like tsunamis or uh, mass debris flows. And many of the sections are also abundantly fossiliferous and have provided all the material uh, that we're looking at today. So here's just some gratuitous ammonite pictures from some of these sites. So what did we actually do? Well, we conducted a, um, a morphometric analysis on uh, our specimens of D. iris on both dimorphs. We measured seven parameters uh, and used these to calculate size and shape ratios through ontogeny. So not just looking at one stage of growth, but several stages of growth with respect to some of these well compression measurements. So on with the results, I'm first going to uh, show some of the geographic results. So the way these plots are arranged uh, are geographically from southwest to northeast, from left to right, color coded according to uh, dimorphs. So the macroconchs in blue, the microconchs in gray, got the number of specimens on the plot there as well. So the first trait we're looking at here is size or L max. So you can see this really nice offset between the larger macroconchs and the smaller microconchs. And although there's some variance at each site, in particular this site in Texas, uh, the mean values are pretty much the same across the entire range of the species. And uh, the boxes and whiskers all overlap. So uh, there's, there's really overall not much geographic variation here. And that's the same in the first of our shape ratios, the uncoiling index Lmax over HP. Again, some variation at each site, but pretty remarkably static across the entire range of the species. Uh, roundness, this is a, a measure we can only do on macroconchs. Uh, you can see, again, a pretty remarkably static across the, the range of these sites. The, the large variance in the values from Texas in, in uh, this particular parameter, I think, are potentially a preservational artifact and something I need to go back and look at in a bit more detail. And then world compression, this is an interesting one because it's often considered quite plastic in ammonites, um, especially with regard to uh, uh, environmental change and uh, also for hydrodynamic reasons. So it's often thought that uh, more compressed ammonite uh, morphotypes are found in, for instance, higher energy environments. So that, that's a trait that's been uh, described in the literature already. Um, I'm just showing you one of the three compression ratios we measured at different stages of ontogeny because actually the data are all pretty similar. And again, some variation here, but uh, overall pretty static. Now, as well as just eyeballing that in box plots, we also uh, tested this statistically using Man Whitney tests to compare statistically significant differences in these traits between sites. So on this table, I'm just illustrating where we do have significant differences in yellow and then which traits are showing those statistically significant differences. Um, really, I think the, the geographic and uh, the statistical analyses do show that there's pretty low morphological variation across the entire geographic range of the species, despite the fact that we're looking at a range of different fasces or paleo environments. And I think those statistically significant differences don't really show any consistent patterns in terms of which sites show them or which traits show them. Uh, so perhaps the, the significance is driven by some bias that we need to explore in the data. But overall, uh, I think we're looking here at geographic stasis in this species. Also interesting, of course, to think about this temporally, if there are any temporal trends. Uh, we've done this mainly for one section, the Owl Creek type locality in Mississippi, which is our longest time series. It's about a nine meter thick section. Um, so here I've just plotted the data stratigraphically at Owl Creek, again, color coded according to a dimorph. So macroconchs and microconchs uh, in blue and gray. And here we're looking at those uh, first three measurements I showed you before, size and then two of the shape ratios as well. And again, you can see that variation up section, but there's no directional trend or temporal trend in these data. Owl Creek is also interesting because the shell material here is very well preserved. So we can actually construct a temperature curve through time using oxygen isotopes. So that was done by my colleague Jocelyn Sessa and some of her collaborators for the iris, other ammonites, and then other mollusks and foraminifera on the, the temperature curve on the right here. And again, you can see quite significant temperature variation at any given horizon, but no trend in these data and certainly no 
um, significant uh, sort of warming and cooling events up section in the data that we have. The same again true for the compression ratios, although uh, what you can see here is that the first ratio there on the left does show quite a, a larger spread in data compared to those taken later in ontogeny, which is interesting and something I'd like to explore in a bit more detail. But really, again, although there's variance in size and shape and temperature up section at Owl Creek, there's no temporal pattern or trend in either of these data sets. And I think we do need to do a little bit more work relating some of those small scale environmental fluctuations to morphological variation. But overall, I think we're looking at temporal stasis here as well. Uh, we do need more stratigraphic data. There are some gaps in this record, and I think we need to do this for some of the other sites. Although, as I said, the stratigraphic sections are pretty small. So what are the implications of this? Um, well, I'm a, a believer that stasis very much is data. Um, so these sort of data sets are interesting. It's a pattern that we need to explain using fossil data sets. And there's a quite vigorous debate in the literature about the mechanisms behind stasis. I think these data are consistent with this hypothesis of so-called dynamic stasis, where you get uh, some shifting trait values, but no uh, accumulation of evolutionary change across the temporal or spatial distribution of their species. And interestingly, we described a similar pattern earlier this year in a closely related heteromorph uh, species, Hoploscophytes nicoletti from the Western Interior Seaway. That was published in Paleontology. So I urge you to go and have a look at that paper if you're interested in this uh, in more detail. In terms of the implications for the KPG, I think these data also point to environmental and ecological stability in a range of these environments across this region prior to the extinction, even in this last little time window um, prior to the extinction. And I think they're also consistent with the benthic mollusk data from this margin published over many years by people like Norm Sol, uh, which demonstrate as for benthic mollusks, ammonites demonstrate this is a single sort of biogeographic province with uh, open dispersal along this margin possible throughout uh, this time interval. And it's also, I, I think, backed up by some of the other work we're doing in this interval. So this is a, a, a diversity plot, effectively, a geographic range chart for cephalopod taxa from the D-iris zone, uh, from the different, many different sites, including some which we haven't used in the morphometric analysis here, uh, along that margin. And you can see, actually, within this little time interval, there's quite a high diversity of uh, cephalopods uh, in, the, in these sections. And if you know your ammonite taxonomy, actually, most of the major groups of ammonites are present right up to the KPG boundary in these sections with no uh, real change in diversity, or I would argue in morphology, at least in this one species. Um, and I think this points really to sort of stable populations uh, during this time interval. So just to, to finish up with some quick conclusions, I think these preliminary data do indicate uh, stasis across the entire spatial temporal range of D-iris in these different environments along this margin. Uh, they do support, I think, expectations of particularly this uh, theory of dynamic stasis, where you do get variance in morphology, but no directional trend. And these sort of data sets are useful for thinking about the mechanisms behind um, that uh, sort of stasis. I think we're looking at environmental stability in these regions prior to a very sudden KPG mass extinction event. And we do need to do a little bit more work on stratigraphic and environmental context. And it might also be interesting to think about some of these uh, uh, quantitative models and model fitting to these data to see if we can distinguish between, for instance, strict stasis and a, a random walk uh, in these data. So I'll finish with some thanks to various people who helped out with uh, data collection uh, and my funding sources and to uh, Pallas and to you for a great meeting. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you so much for starting us off today. A uh, reminder to everybody to post your questions in the chat. There is a very slight delay before we can see them. So the sooner you get in your questions, the better. Um, I have a question for you in the meantime. Um, earlier on, you mentioned that there was kind of an anomaly going on in Texas, which you thought might be a preservational artifact. Could you say more what specifically you think is going on there? Yes, uh, so uh, those specimens are three-dimensional, but I a lot of them are preserved um, on bedding surfaces. They're slightly, slightly differential preservation compared to the other sites, which have uh, more sort of traditional three-dimensional preservation. 
And it doesn't seem to affect things like size, but some of those shape ratios, I think it probably is showing up. Um, but I thought those data were still worth including in the talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's one other quick question here we can squeak in um, from Crispin Little. Dynamic stasis equivalent to a random walk? How different? Uh, that depends on who you talk to in the, in the community that's studying this. Um, uh, I would agree that probably they're pretty much the same thing. Um, and it's mostly a semantic difference. Great. Thank you so much. And we'll move on to our next talk. We have Katie Collins, who's going to tell us about shell coiling. I'll start your presentation for you. There you go. Take it away. Still on mute. Thank you. So. Hopefully you can now hear me. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell you about coiling in helicospiral gastropods, which is uh, a shape analysis. So we started off with James telling us about shape in planar spiral mollusks. We're going to think about helicospirals now. Uh, where's the button? There's the button. So I started off years ago thinking, okay, how am I going to measure a snail? Right, that seems like a really vague concept, but... I come from the GM background and working with landmarks, the first thing is you really have to have the same number of landmarks per specimen. And I don't know if you've ever looked at two snails, but generally the idea of getting the same number of landmarks for every single snail is not easy. And as you include, as you increase the disparity of the group you're trying to look at, you decrease the amount of available landmarks. So you end up, uh, really eroding the morphology that you can capture in order to increase the diversity of your sample. So the next port of call is usually outlines. And here again, we have this question of well, what's the appropriate outline? You can do the substandard uh, orientation for illustration here, and people have done, and you can get some really good results out of that. But it usually will end up sort of recapitulating uh, taxonomy because largely we tell the difference between these things and we we always consider them in this orientation and that shape doesn't really tell you a lot about the ecology of the animal uh, and as modeled here by my lovely assistant Lobardus Gygus you see that the life position of the animal is in fact quite different and equally difficult to say that that's a really definitive outline to use. So as beautifully summarized by Alex Nutzel, uh, torsion is a pivotal apomorphy of the clade and any 2D projection of a snail has pros, but also cons. So I thought to myself naively, well, let's think about ways we could use the spiral. Can we come up with a spiral morphometrics? And fortunately for me, many older and wiser heads than mine have already been down this track. And there's a long and beautiful history of theoretical shell morphology, looking at growth and coiling in mollusks in general and in snails. And if you're interested in, in morphology of snails at all, you will have come across this paper, Raup 66, the Raup cube. And the theoretical morphospace used here has been used successfully for ammonites and it's been used for biconvex brachiopods, so for planar spiral animals. It hasn't particularly been used successfully for snails, bivalves, or scaphopods, the helicospirals. So, I went into this and I thought, okay, so the model isn't maybe working well for helicospirals, we'll test it. And so this is where I really need to kind of emphasize the difference in approach here. So there's a theoretical morphospace where you start with a model, and your model defines your axes. And that allows you to compare lots of different specimens. You can drop them in, you can take them out. It doesn't affect the morphospace because the morphospace is defined by the model. An empirical morphospace, like the kind you might build with a PCA, comes from measurements and the sample that you put in defines the axes. Uh, so there's a there's a sort of a difference going on there. So I went back to the original model. I said, why is this? Why are they using the logarithmic helicospiral? And it turns out that essentially the basis of the, the logarithmic helicospiral is two assumptions and one set of measurements. The set of measurements is whirl radii going down the spire. How wide is it as it grows? Uh, and that shows an exponential growth rate, which would produce a logarithmic spiral. The other fundamental and important concept is that the model assumes self-similarity of growth, right? So they called it uh, mnemonic growth in 1914. We will call it isometric growth. 
However, if you've ever looked at the inside of a snail, you know that they're not growing isometrically. And so the, the, the method I used was to essentially cut up a bunch of snails. I did it with a rock saw, and we also did some fossils at the Australian Synchrotron. If you think about a regularly coiling snail, it's a tube going around an axis, right? So if you can find the centroid of that tube, then you can pass models through those points and find the one that fits the data best. So that's all I set out to do. Uh, and if you slice a regularly coiling snail down its middle, you have 180 degree increments around, which is really convenient for getting this kind of spiral data. So part of the reason that I suspect that the, the model wasn't fitting well is if you use the shoulder nodule as your landmark of the coiling of the spiral, you notice from this diagram that actually the relative position of that shoulder landmark to the aperture centroid shifts through ontogeny and it doesn't shift uh, evenly. So different taxa have different relationships of their shoulder modules, if they even have them, and the centroid of the tube that the animal lives in. And uh, I've got a, a cowrie here that actually we cut in half, and um, Stefano showed us earlier that they, they envelop themselves. They're really hard to work out using this sort of, uh, the theory of the logarithm. And as you can see here, they just they don't fit particularly well, and they're really not self-similar. So we captured the outlines of each of these serial apertures around the sliced snail, and that allows us to model parameters that are conceptually analogous, but not uh, mathematically analogous to the ones that Raup did. So uh, increase in whirl area, shape of the aperture, the translation down the axis, and the distance of the axis to the aperture. So if you know your snails, that's how umbilicate is it. And you can model the rate of change of each of those with increasing coiling, so increasing theta, the degrees around the coiling axis. So we fit linear log, exponential power law, and quadratic models to see if one of these would be better than the others to model these four different parameters. If uh, Mosley and subsequently Thompson and Raup and everybody else who's, who's uh, asserted a logarithmic Peter viral model is correct, all of these parameters should come out exponential. The exponential rate creates the logarithmic helicose spiral. So, and they don't. <laughs> it's kind of the summary. So, whirl expansion, which is the one that they could actually measure in the 1800s and which was propagated through, that one is exponential. They got their measurements right. I cannot fault them. But translation down the axis, distance of the aperture from the axis and shape change are all modeled best by different models. So power law, polynomial, and linear. Uh, so this is why the logarithmic helicospiral is not the best model for snails. And this is why it's difficult to get snails into that route morpher space in what Schindel called in his 1990 paper, a satisfying way. So here's the space so far. This is the analog of that route cube. Uh, and I think, I could talk about this for days, but I'll just boil it right down. If you look in the top left-hand corner, the, the T versus W uh, plot, you've got two main groups of snails there. You've got a pink and green group, and you've got a red and teal group. And the pink are turritellids, and the greens are uh, siliquarians. Those are both serithioids, and they have very, very similar T and W parameters. Whereas if you look on the other side, the teal ones are the struthiolarids and the red ones are apareids, which are putatively the ancestral group of the struthiolarids, and they're almost entirely indistinguishable by coiling parameters, which I think is really cool. So, I mean, I can, I can talk about this for a long time. I could show you places where I wish we'd done other things, where I need more samples, but I thought a cool way to do this would be to show you guys kind of an illustration of one way that we are currently using this. So this is very preliminary. This is sort of in progress right now. But I'm interested in a group of snails called the Struthiolaria D, which are sort of the poor cousins of the strombids. And they are currently not very diverse. There are about five species of them. But in the past, around the Southern Ocean, there have been in excess of 70, 80 species through the, the Cretaceous Cenozoic. Um, and so here are some evolutionary hypotheses, shall we say, that I've diagrammed out. These have not been, these are not uh, phylogenetic analyses. These are relationships people discussed in text. Uh, 
And the kind of the important thing I want you to notice here is that the yellow ones, the Tylospira, which is an Australian group, are always linked with the New Zealand species, right? Uh, so all of the living struthiolarians are fusiform. But if you go back in time, each lineage becomes, well, each lineage started out, I should say, to get the polarity of the sentence, right? Very, very globose. But in, in any rate, the very fusiform Australian living species, Tylospira scutellata, is almost always allied in people's minds with the New Zealand species. But if we take a moment and we go and look at the biogeography of the situation, the circumantarctic current goes the wrong way. It's very easy to get from Australia to New Zealand or from New Zealand to South America, but it's, it's quite difficult to get from New Zealand to Australia. That's going against the current. Um, so if we think about that and we think about the morphology, you'll see that through time, we start out very globose in the Cretaceous with Conchothyra there. And then in the Eocene, we get two lineages. The blue one, Monolaria, stays in New Zealand, and it's quite a different shape from those Conchothyras and a number of different parameters. But in uh, Seymour Island, you, you, can't, you get Perissodonta suddenly turns up this quite globose thing, which in most of its parameters is very, very similar to Conchothyra. And as time goes on and the Drake Passageway opens up and you get this inception of the Circumantarctic Current, we've still got this endemic New Zealand lineage that's staying in place and doing its thing and becoming very fusiform. But suddenly this globose thing shows up in Australia, which is almost indistinguishable from the globose things that are going on in uh, the Subantarctics and South America. And then in today we've got the situation where we have uh, four or five species that are all fusiform. So I think what we're actually seeing here is rather than the today's geographic proximity and the fact that the modern species are all fusiform, I think what we might have going on is actually there's been two lineages, a sort of a New Zealand endemic lineage that stayed in place and a circum Antarctic lineage that's traveled all the way around the ACC, globose as goes and has landed in Australia and stayed in the subantarctics, and each of those independent offshoots have also just become more fusiform with time. Obviously, this is an idea to test rather than a, uh, uh, a phylogeny that I've built, but uh, this is kind of where we're at, and this is one of those uses of spiral morphometrics that I'm thinking of, because you can't really morphometrically compare Conchothyra, which is basically entirely enveloped with callus. It's a golf ball of an animal to something like Tylospira scutellata, which is very en uh, elongate and slender and fusiform. But using the spiral morphometrics, you can. So in conclusion, what I really would like people to take away from this is the four parameters that describe the helicospiral are not all logarithmic in form or exponential in rate. Not all gastropods are best described by the same models. And in fact, not all gastropods are best described by the same models throughout their ontogeny. So I'm thinking of things like Extractrix. I'm thinking of uh, Cereon. I'm sure you can think of other things where the, the snail starts out coiling one way and then changes its mind and goes off and coils in a different way. The method and the code that we uh, built this on uh, will be available for others to use. It's all written in our markdown and that paper is in review. And we've also got this uh, potential hypothesis of struthiolariad uh, evolution that we're working more on. Hopefully soon we'll extend to bivalves, ammonites, and scaphopods if we're really lucky. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Ewan Smith, who helped us out with some of the math and also gave us the title of the paper, the staff at the Australian Synchrotron, and the curators who gave us specimen access. Uh, it says here sometimes at very short notice, uh, one museum very kindly fielded a, a slightly hysterical email from me at 1 a.m. while I was at the Synchrotron and let me into the collection at 9 a.m. that same day, which was very kind of them. If you have any questions, I'll happily take those either here uh, on Twitter, you can get me at Spisatella or in the Discord. Thank you, Thank you so much for that. I'm monitoring the chat here. It looks like we're still waiting for questions to come rolling in. Um, I personally thought it was really interesting how you're thinking about current flow patterns and how, um, how we can relate geographic patterns and morphology uh, to these biogeographic patterns. Um, so what's next? Do you have some future prospects for phylogeography? <laughs> 
So the the link between the opening of the Drake Passageway and mollusks getting around Antarctica that's not that's not new at all. Uh, I think a really good summary of it is one of Alan Bue's papers in '97 in Tectonophysics on that subject of molluscan connections around South America and and Antarctica. But yeah, I think so. The history of Struthiolariidae as a group is very interesting, and it's quite detailed in terms of where they like the relative timing of where they pop up and when. So yeah, I think I'm really looking forward to finishing up the revision of that group and weaving together the biogeography and the morphology together because I think separately neither of them is really telling you the whole story. You have to have both of them to get the whole thing together. Yeah, that sounds like a really nice integrative framework. I look forward to it. We do have one other quick question here uh, from Crispin Little. Destructive sampling and expensive synchrotron rook. Maybe not the best friends for rare specimens? Well, I mean, no, but on the other hand, there's only one specimen of Tyler's Gyrodromorata. It's the holotype, and they did let me take it to the synchrotron after I signed my soul away in blood, but uh, they did let me. Uh, no. So one other future direction that we've got going on this is ways to try and basically to look for ways to do this without having to cut them up, right? The reason that we cut them down the middle is to get the whole of the aperture in order to find the centroid of each aperture. That's the crucial thing that we need in order to that the rest of the math sort of rests on. So we're very interested in working out ways that we can try and approximate these results using exterior markers. Uh, absolutely. That is a major drawback. Great. Well, thanks for answering that. We're going to move on to our next talk now. Uh, so up next, we have Emanuela De Martino. This presentation, I will start um, telling us about offspring size evolution. So I'm really excited to hear it. Thank you, Gwen, and thanks everybody for attending this talk. As you just heard, my name is Emanuela Di Martino, and I'm currently a postdoc uh, researcher at the Natural History Museum in Oslo in Norway. Today's talk is about offspring size evolution in a colonial marine invertebrate lineage, specifically a genus of chylosome bryozoans. Life history, we know, is the schedule of an individual life, including birth, growth, reproduction, and survival. Some of life history traits include size at birth, age and size at maturity, the length of an individual life, but also the number and size of offspring. Actually, this latter trait, the offspring size, has, uh, is one of the most important among all uh, life history traits because it has a direct impact on fitness, which means, in other words, that it has a direct impact on the evolutionary success of the organism. In a previous studies uh, that I actually presented the last year at Palas in Valencia, uh, we looked at a single species of chylosome bryozoan that you can see in this SCM picture on the side, Antartodotum gima, for which we have uh, specimens from six different time intervals of the Pleistocene. And we have been able to uh, measure life history traits uh, from fossil specimens, because as you probably know, uh, chylosome bryozoans are calcified, so they uh, are, have a very rich fossil record, and uh, the different modules have a different uh, morphology depending on the function. So in the uh, SCM you see on the side, the module in orange is a feeding module, the one in green is a male module, and the one outlined in blue is a female module. And for Antarctotoa, we have been able to measure the sides of the reproductive structures, which is the globular structure in the female module. And this is quite important because it has been demonstrated for uh, several species of chylosome red zone that the size of the reproductive structure is a reliable proxy for offspring or, in other words, larval size. For Antarctotoa, we found a strong relationship between the size of the feeding modules, again in orange, and the size of the reproductive structure in blue. 
to expand on this, we decided to look at uh, as many uh, species as we could in another genus of Kylostom bryozoan, Microporella. Why we choose this genus? First, because it's very distinctive, and uh, as you can see from the different SCMs that I put together in this slide, it is cosmopolitan, so it is found at all latitudes. Uh, it has a, uh, an age range going from the Miocene, about 23 million years ago, to the recent. It's very diverse, with more than uh, 150 species described to date. And again, as in uh, Antarctotoa, the reproductive structures are uh, fossilizable and uh, easily measurable from uh, the um, uh, fossil specimen. And again, uh, they, the measure of this structure can be used as a, a proxy for offspring sites. What we did in practice is um, to measure uh, traits as the feeding modularia, and the perimeter of which is outlined in uh, black in this SCM, and the size, the area of the reproductive structures outlined in white in the, in the image. For uh, each species, we had a total of 57 contemporary species and um, 27 fossil species. We measured one colony per species, and uh, in each colony we measured uh, 10 uh, feeding modules and 10 reproductive structures. And we annotated the picture in order to be able to go back to the original trait if we need to repeat the measurements. The first question we pose is, does uh, paleolatitude or latitude, depending on the nature of the specimens, whether contemporary or fossil, explain offspring size variation in microporella beyond the constraint of module size, as we have seen in uh, Antarctotoa? These two uh, panels show the raw data for log feeding module area and uh, log offspring area with the species of microporella grouped by latitude. And already from the raw data, we can see a sort of trend with this concavity towards the center of the plot, meaning that there is a decrease in uh, size for both feeding modules and offspring towards lower latitudes. Uh, because uh, we have uh, a sea surface temperature values for uh, contemporary species, but we only have latitude or uh, paleolatitude for fossil species, uh, we uh, test whether we can use uh, latitude as a, a suitable substitute of uh, temperature. In Antarctotoa, the plot shaded in light blue on the right side, we saw that there is um, a strong effect of paleoclimatic conditions as uh, approximated by delta O18 in the sides of feeding modules. But in that case, we only had six points uh, to plot, corresponding to the six different time intervals. In this case, we have about 90 species, uh, so it should be more uh, meaningful. And actually, we found a good uh, correlation between sea surface temperature and uh, absolute latitude, which means that we can confidently use uh, absolute latitude as a proxy for temperature. Uh, in this plot, uh, um, you can see the fit of uh, mean log feeding module area and absolute paleolatitude. The color coding uh, refers to the type of specimens. In blue, uh, the recent contemporary species. In red, the fossil ones. And in black, all species together. We see a positive relationship between the log feeding module area and absolute paleolatitude which is, however, statistically significant only uh, for the recent species.
If we look at uh, this other plot, which shows the same, but for log of spring area, we see that for both contemporary and fossil species, there is a positive relationship between the area of the offspring and uh, latitude or paleolatitude. And in this case, if you look at the p-values, it is significant for both uh, categories. The second question we ask is, uh, does size variation in the microporella conform to COPS rule and or the out of the tropics hypothesis? COPS rule can be defined in brief as the tendency of an organism to give rise to lineages which increase in size over time. And uh, it has been investigated in uh, different groups of uh, animals or uh, organisms. Uh, vertebrates, and probably this example uh, illustrated here of Cenozoic horses is one of the most popular, but also invertebrates, including bryozoans. In this recent paper published in Evolution by my co-author and Paul Taylor, uh, it has been demonstrated that, yes, uh, chylosome bryozoans conform uh, to COPS rule, which means that descendant species have uh, larger feeding module size than ancestral species. And in other papers where uh, we look at competition for space among bryozoan colonies uh, species, uh, we saw that having big modules uh, is an advantage to win a competitive interaction, as in this as it is shown in this uh, SEM uh, picture on the side. Again, this is the raw data, in this case with species grouped by time in million years. And uh, although there is not a clear pattern, it seems that older species have both feeding module and offspring areas smaller than uh, younger or contemporary species. Uh, in absence of an independent phylogenetic hypothesis uh, to determinate all the plausible uh, ancestor-descendant pairs among microporella species, we use two uh, different approaches. In the first approach, one stratigraphically older species of microporella could give rise to only one and randomly selected stratigraphically younger species. While in the second approach, one older species of microporella could give uh, rise to uh, any and multiple species uh, that are younger. Uh, the results of both approaches are the same. So here for a matter of uh, time, I will just show the results of this latter approach where an older species can give rise to any and multiple uh, younger species. This is the distribution of the binomial probability of uh, an ancestral species to give rise to larger descendant species. And uh, you can see that for both log feeding module area and the log of spring area, the uh, binomial probability is higher than uh, the null hypothesis of no size difference. Uh, it is 0 0.67 for feeding module area and 0 0.66 for offspring area. In uh, uh, the black dot in the distribution is the mean and uh, in brackets you can see the 95% uh, confidence interval. We were wondering, however, if this uh, size difference could be explained by an out of the tropics uh, scenario, which means that there is an overrepresentation of uh, species, of younger species that move from the equator uh, to uh, higher latitudes, to northwards or southwards. Uh, but actually, uh, we saw that uh, no, latitudinal shifts do not explain much beyond, beyond what is already described by a putative ancestral descendant species. So there is not uh, an out of the tropics uh, scenario that we can uh, consider in this case. <clears throat> 
So just to summarize the answers to our research questions, yes, we saw that pallid attitude has an effect uh, on offspring size and also module size, but it's weak. So the main factor is still the, the structural link between the module size and the reproductive structure size. We also saw that uh, bridged zones uh, in this case, Kylson bridged zones and this genus in particularly um, conform to COPS rule. And before we knew that that was real for feeding module sites. And uh, now we know that it's also true for offspring sites or reproductive structure sites. And uh, no, we cannot invoke in this case an out of the tropics uh, scenario. Thank you so much for listening, and uh, it's all. Thank you so much for that. Let's stop the slides here. We do have a question in the chat from Daniela Schmidt, um, who's asking what the relationship is between mother organisms and offspring size. So I'm assuming um, actual individual size differences rather than species parent-child relationships. E What's that relationship geographically and through time? So, uh, as you know, bryozoans are uh, colonial organisms, so define the size of the individual itself is uh, very difficult because uh, they can grow indeterminately. So in this case, uh, uh, another problem we have with the fossil is with not we cannot really measure the size of the colony. So we base all our measurements on the on the sides of uh, the module. So I don't think I can answer more specifically that question. So in... yeah. No, thank you for that. Daniela, if you have a follow-up question, feel free to post that in the chat and you can answer it in the chat as well. Um, we're going to move on, but thank you again. Thank you. Outside the realm of mollusks. And we'll move on now to Steve Pates. Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction and uh, for those really, really cool talks up to now. And thanks for sticking with us to get to the end of the session. So I'm going to talk to you today about a project that we've been working on for a couple of years, looking at the Cambrian uh, bivalve arthropod isoxis and uh, morphological variation in, and potential impacts that might have on the hydrodynamics of the animal. And specifically thinking about potential implications for our, our understanding of the complexity of the Cambrian biological pump. So just to kind of jump straight in to a quick uh, overview of what the biological pump looks like. So it's basically the fixation of uh, organic nutrients by photosynth photosynthesizers in the surface ocean and how they are transported uh, to the deep ocean. So one way is that uh, these phytoplankton are grazed on and then through a combination of fecal pellets uh, and sinking phytoplankton sticking together, we form these large aggregates, which then uh, provide energy uh, and nutrients for demersal communities on the uh, bottom of the ocean. Uh, and in the Cambrian, we do have good evidence for grazing on phytoplankton, uh, for example, from uh, small carbonaceous fossils. Uh, and we learned a bit about that uh, from the stage three, stage four boundary earlier in this uh, palace meeting, and as well as the la uh, the, the radiodont uh, data from Utah. So in the Cambrian, we have um, kind of this part of the biological pump um, operating in a similar architecture to the modern. However, what's received a bit less attention is the um, in, the influence or the possibility that two-way vertical migration is, is operating at this time. Um, and that's going to be kind of the topic of this talk, looking at the uh, by that geothrod isoxis. So as a potential two-way vertical migrator, it's a good place to go because people have suggested that unlike many other Cambrian animals, isoxis had a pelagic habit. But if you kind of give, want to have a brief overview of what this animal looks like, we have this carapace with this prominent anterior and posterior spine, which kind of unites all the species within the genus. Exceptional preservation uh, has revealed its soft parts. So we know that it's got these swimming, fla uh, swimming, swimming flaps here uh, and endopods, which are not shown. Um, and then a predatory lifestyle is supported by the paired serial midgut glands. These raptorial appendages and these very large eyes can make up to 10% of the total animal body length. Um, 
And so I mentioned before that it had been uh, suggested to have a pelagic lifestyle. And this is based on comparisons with modern animals such as Nathothalsia zoea, uh, which is in the top right of your screen. Um, and Nathothalsia zoea is found both in the surface waters and up to depths of 1500 meters or even 3000 meters. So it's an animal that's uh, apparently uh, active vertically in the modern oceans. And it's an prominent anterior and posterior spines in the carabase have com been compared to Isoxus taxa, like Isoxus longissimus, you can see there. Um, however, most, most recent workers have suggested that Isoxus species were best suited to being hyperbenthic predators. So that's living in the 10 meters above the sea floor. Although Fuertal noted that there's significant variation in the uh, carapace morphologies and, that, and push for a, a variable ecology. So like a one size fits all doesn't, doesn't quite work for the genus. So that's what we're gonna look at today. So the first aim is to quantify this variation in carapace morphology and look at um, ways in which the carapace change uh, differs between different species. But then to kind of put this in a hydrodynamic context, so look at the influence that this has on the hydrodynamics of the carapaces. And lastly, to put it back into the biological pump in the cavern and see what we can say about it. So very briefly, just to give you an overview of the, the way that we quantify the morphological variation. So in the interest of time, it's gonna be very snappy. So constructed outlines for 20 isoxus species 11 Nathothalsia, so that's the modern, uh, modern arthropod, one of Surisicaris, which is the sister taxon to Isoxus, and then six to Zoya, so this is another Cambrian bivalve duarthropod. And the idea here was to basically compare Isoxus to modern animals and also to co-occurring Cambrian animals. So these outlines were subjected to an electrical Fourier analysis using the MOMOX package in R, and then the results of that analysis were then visualized in this PCA plot. And you can see kind of at a first look that Isoxus covers a, most, of the, um, most of the space here, overlapping with Nathophausia on the right, but also that many of those dots, so each dot represents a species, appear to be closer to Sarusicaris and to Zoya than Nathophausia, so seeing some, some variation in the Isoxus carapace shape visualized here. Um, I was interested to see, like, to quantify this a bit more, so I subjected it to a hierarchical clustering analysis in the space, and it created these four clusters. So in the top left are all the two zoya species, which are clustering together. As we continue clockwise round, we have one isoxus species with three Nathophausia and Nathophausia group one. Continuing round, we've got more isoxus with the remaining eight Nathophausias. And then in the bottom left, we have the, a large group of isoxus with Sarusicaris. So we're seeing some isoxus are more similar to Nathophausias, some are more similar to Sarusicaris. To kind of break down what this PC plot is showing us, if we start with the Sarusicaris group, we have isoxus taxa which have a broadly symmetric carapace outline and very short spines. As we move across uh, positive into PC1, the carapace becomes more asymmetric and the spine length increases. As we move up uh, into move up in PC2, uh, up into Nathophausia group one the anterior spine becomes much longer than the posterior spine and the carapace remains asymmetric. So we're seeing these two broad um, variations. We're seeing an asymmetric carapace and a lengthening of the spines. And so that's kind of the, what we wanted to test with the uh, fluid dynamics analysis. So for the hydrodynamics analysis, you, I used uh, ANSYS uh, Academic, which is a modern engineering uh, com computational fluid dynamics uh, simulator. And the first step was to import the outlines directly from our electrical furrow analysis into a virtual flume tank constructed of these elements. Now, uh, there's a higher density of elements around the animal because that's where all the fun stuff happens. Um, a flow of three quarters of a body length per second was applied, and this has been observed in modern Nathophasia in, in the tanks. And then a number of different angles of attacks were considered for each animal. Um, so the angle of attack is just how you point your nose in the flow. So a positive angle of attack, you pointed your nose up. A negative angle of attack, you point your nose down. And this is to get a fuller idea of the hydrodynamic capabilities of these animals rather than just sticking them in one orientation. Um, and the numbers we're interested in for the purpose of this talk are the lift coefficient and the drag coefficient. So these are measures of the lift, so the upwards force and the drag, and that's kind of like the resistance force for swimming, created by these shapes in the flow normalized to a reference area, which in this case is the dorsal length, um, which is what you use when you're comparing lift and drag in, um, for example, modern plane wings. And these results can be plotted up in a drag polar. So this is a plot of lift coefficient on the y-axis against drag coefficient on the x-axis. And each of those dots represents a different 
fluid dynamics experiment. And to break it down for you, so this is Nathophalia zoea, so this is the animal that lives in the modern ocean. Um, to break it down for you, we're going to look at the uh, range of lift coefficients. So if you think about being a vertical migrator, you want to be able to generate both positive and negative lift over a broad range to be vertically mobile. And we're also going to think about the minimum drag coefficient, as this gives an idea of um, horizontal maneuverability. And a lower drag coefficient will mean that you're able to travel at, for example, faster speeds without resulting in unsteady or um, unsteady flow. So looking at the isoxis data, we see that we're covering a broad region of the drag polar and the, the morphology appears to have quite a very, uh, quite an effect on the swimming capability. So to start on the right hand side with these two uh, taxa, which were with clustering with Sarusicaris, so you can see that the uh, outlines are broadly symmetrical and the spines are very short. And we see that our lift coefficients cover a limited range and they're all in the positive realm. So there's not a good, uh, not a broad range of lift coefficients. And also that these two taxa have the highest drag coefficients. So we're seeing that these two, Sarusicaris kind of type morphologies are um, our least hydrodynamic shapes that we analyzed. Moving on, uh, more positive in PC1. So we're becoming more asymmetric. Uh, and we see that the asymmetry decreases our minimum drag coefficient. And also we can see the impact of spines by comparing these two species. So Isoxus mackenziensis has very short spines and maintains a similar limited range of lift coefficients. As we lengthen the spines with communis, we then enter the negative realm of lift coefficients and also broaden our overall range. So we're becoming more able to move up and down in the water column. Lastly, with these extreme taxa, which have very long spines, and we see Isoxus paradoxus there, which is our one animal clustering with um, the Nathophasia group one, we see a broad range of lift, lift coefficients and the lowest drag coefficients of, coefficients of all the taxa analyzed. And so these guys are our best candidates vertical migrators. And just to uh, plonk on the Nathophalsia data there, we're seeing a broad coverage of the same area in the drag polar space. So this is telling us that maybe we do have good candidates for vertical migrators, but do we have other evidence that can help support this? Well, we've got suitable food in the surface oceans in the form of some of those um, smaller uh, crown group crustaceans. And also um, things like um, smaller shelly fossil data, we see that the um, art, small arthropods enter the pelagic realm at this time as well. In the sea floor, uh, we, can see, we can compare the abundances of these taxa in fossil deposits. So the least hydrodynamic taxa, which are interpreted for, um, for kind of benthic lifestyle or living close to the sea floor, are far more abundant in the burger shale and Chengjiang biota than are vertically migrating uh, suggested pelagic animals like um, Paradoxus and Longissimus. So this is giving us an idea that maybe there's some a good, uh, good corroborating evidence, not from the hydrodynamics that support our conclusions as well. Um, so lastly, just a brief overview of the um, kind of import, potential importance for this. Well, this is giving us some support for this second vector of this modern style biological pump happening in the Cambrian Ocean. So at least in modern architecture, though we can't give um, kind of quantified amounts of how much of this two-way vertical migration is happening or how much it's contributing at this time. But it's more than just a second vector. It also has transports uh, nutrients in a slightly different way. So we're seeing um, in modern ocean that two-way vertical migrators move much quicker. So they transport the, um, transport the nutrients much more quickly and transport it in a kind of richer in nitrogen way because of the speed. And they can also repackage sinking aggregates as well. So um, just to kind of briefly sum up what we've seen, that you've seen that the variation in asymmetry in spine lake does affect the hydrodynamic performance of isoxus species, and that some of these could be compared to modern vertical migrators or modern, uh, modern pelagic animals. However, others likely remain close to the seafloor and more hyperbenthic lifestyle, as has been suggested uh, by previous workers as well. And this gives us support for kind of a modern style architecture for the Cambrian biological pump. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening uh, and thank the Harvard lab or the Ortega Hollandis lab for being my kind of lab home for the last year and a bit. And uh, the Museum of Comparative Zoology for um, fund the funding as well. And the Palace meeting, because this has been really something to look forward to in the dark winter of 2020. So thank you very much. Uh, Thanks so much for that, Steve. Really interesting research and research questions, as evidenced by the fact that we have a slew of questions for you in the chat. We probably won't be able to get to all of them, but 
we'll do our best. And thanks also for, for tuning in at a very early time in your time zone. <laughs> so we'll, we'll start uh, with the first question down from Russell Garwood, who says, this is super cool work. Thanks for presenting. What impact do you think the third dimension and variability, variability in it, in the carabase shape, might have on the drag and lift coefficients of these creatures? Um, yeah, so that's a, like a very important thing to consider is the importance of this third dimension. So the reason to consider two dimensions in this study was basically to break it down and think about what's changing, what can we, what changes can we observe, what morph morphological variation do we observe in isoxis? And then when we look at the, uh, for example, um, when you get kind of a dorsal view of tax from the Boga shell, they seem to be quite, have quite parallel valves. So the kind of, the variation we're observing is in two dimensions and we're seeing them with parallel valves. So the kind of 2D uh, simulations was to kind of simplify it down to testing what we can observe directly. In terms of a third dimension, so that's kind of like the, how wide the carapace would be. Uh, and that kind of relates to something that uh, Susana Gattaro was looking at um, yesterday as well. So this will, of course, influence um, the hydrodynamic performance with kind of a, a more slender shape being more streamlined. Um, but it's not something that I thought we could test in terms of the variation in isoxis because I don't think we can get good data on how much that is changing. So yes, if you're going to compare these shapes, you're kind of assuming that does that does stay, that does stay consistent. Great, thanks for that. Uh, we have a question from Katie Collins, who also says this is awesome work, and asks, is there any observed data for your living arthropods in the water column that could ground truth the drag estimates for the extinct ones? Um, so you mean in terms of like um, comparing modern and vertical migrators with modern things that just kind of stick around on the, on the seafloor uh, in kind of a similar size. So the reason that I chose um, Nathapazi to compare it to is, well, other people have done it before, and also because it's a similar sized animal. So we can compare some of the Reynolds numbers. So that's uh, to do with the size of the animal and how fast it moves in the water column. Um, so that's why I kind of did a quick kind of comparison of the 2D uh, drag and lift coefficients with that animal. Um, it would be cool to kind of fish them up and actually get some some um, empirical data in a flume tank to compare them to. I think that would be quite tricky for me to do right now. Um, but yeah, I think that would be a nice way to broaden out the study and add complexity. And I think the third dimension is another way to kind of build a, a layer a layer of complexity on this as well. Yeah, thanks for that. That actually relates to Derek Briggs' next question. Um, he says, very elegant talk, assuming I assume that your lift and drag measurements take into account the fact that the abdomen of Nathophasia extends beyond the carapace and that of Isoxys does not. Um, so, yeah, this is a very quick comparison, but that's definitely an important thing to consider. And something else that came from reading the papers on kind of observing swimming, swimming in Nathophasia is actually that that um, abdomen does change orientation as they speed up. So when they're kind of swimming around, poodling around, the tail will be stuck down like that. And as they swim faster, it actually becomes in a more streamlined position. So I think um the comparison yeah is just on the carapace shape and the influence of that adding in more body parts and um more bits and pieces will get, potentially give a more comprehensive comparison great thank you so much there are a couple more questions you can answer in the chat or over on discord we're at the end of this session uh, so we've reached our short break give your eyes a rest from looking at the screen um, 